How do we, as Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians, find our way forward from our history? Well, after a career in the Canadian Army as a UN peacekeeper working in Germany, France and Cyprus, followed by a 20-year stint on the Blackfoot Police Force, Elder Clarence Mixicam stepped into the challenge with strength, wisdom and grace. Since turning 70, he has spent countless hours serving as an advisor, speaker and counsellor with both Indigenous and non-Indigenous organizations. This after his own start at a local residential school. When I was six and a half years old, I was, uh, I went, I call it, I don't call it a school, I call it a place, that place. As the old people said, you're going to go to this place and I, you won't be coming home. I says, why not? He says, well, that's where your parents went. I says, okay. He says, you got to be, you got to have courage. You got to get yourself. I was four years old when he told me. So all I knew was ceremony, our language, everything, old people. And uh, so I went. My, my mother dressed me up really nice, new clothes, make it presentable. That's the way we are. We like to be proud of who we are. So I went to that school. But the thing about it, the priest uh, was very nice to me. But as soon as my parents left, it was the other way around. Rough of the neck, down the hall. Okay, you go down there. Oh, you gotta go upstairs, change your clothes. Took all my new clothes, threw them in a bag, hung them up, gave me denim coveralls with a big number, 61, I still remember. Welcome to the residential school. Couldn't speak my language. But that's all I knew. I broke in English. So that's where I, I started my uh, my orientation, I call it, into this this new thing called the white man's way of doing things. So uh, I managed to finish. Then I went to another school on uh, towards the West Cars Land grade seven, eight, nine. And then I, the teacher was very racist. And a guy comes out, she raises his hand in residential school, you go like this. But I was old enough to know, I think he's gonna hit me. So I jumped up and I checked him. So he went to the principal's and they, they, they came after me to it. And good thing one little boy ran down to my the high school wing got my my three big brothers. They're pretty big, tough guys. They came to me and said, what are you doing to my little brother? You want to fight, we'll take you. I don't think I want to fight with cowboys. <laughs> so I got kicked out. I said, I, I went to County and Vulcan. I finished my school. And I eventually came to Calgary. So it was then that I realized, I, I started to understand that there, there are people that are not so good. There are people that are very, they'd like to know you. So that's when I uh, said, maybe I should, I shouldn't be too uh, negative with the so-called white man. And some people are like that, some are not. So in my, in my line of work, uh, I became, I, I joined the military. Just got tired of school, grade 11, good marks and everything. I wanted a break. So I joined the military and I shipped out of here by train to Shiloh, Manitoba, outside Brand School of Artillery. Became an artillery man. Then we waited for orders to, two battle groups were being formed. And I got shipped to Gagetown, you know, outside of Fredericton, more training. And then we were waiting for the orders to two battle groups. We were going to fly into the Mediterranean, North Africa, full battle ready. So we flew out 245, February exactly. And that's when we went, knew why we were with the UN forces, Cyprus, North Africa, my home base is in Germany. But that's where I kept up. But then 67 at the point of a nuclear war. And we fired the surface surface missiles. That's attached to 69th US surface surface missile battery. So I was in I was in charge of three missile launchers. We fired ten missiles, 
whole nuclear ready. Imagine putting on a nuclear warhead. And we're trying to fight in a nuclear war. United States with TEPCOM 3 halfway across to the land. We're getting into a nuclear war. So we sat, we moved, we looked at radio signals on the other side. I understood a little bit of Russian and German because I'm listening to the radio. Then finally, we're so happy at stand down that diplomatic, they came together. And we were staring right at the other missile launchers on the other side. And the guy on the other side waved. Thank God. So we hiked here. Three weeks out there. If we had a war, that would be the end of this world. I was 18 and a half years old then. So I came back, I became a federal officer appointed by the commissioner of the RCMP. I was I reported to the detachment in Beijing. And then I got tired of it. Province took over police and on reserves. We became special constables. They lost 36 federal officers overnight. There's only two of us left. We held in there. And then I started my own police force shortly after that. And uh, we, we were just that close to being autonomous. I helped start Louis Bull in the north, Blood Tribe in the south with my friend. And uh, some of my officers are still in Chutina, just outside Calgary. Some of my adopted son is the chief of police in the Bloods, two officers in the north. And I have someone that trained him. Yes, I, I'm advising now and then. And then, uh, 14 years I did that. Then I took a break and I worked in the federal penitentiaries. From being a chief of police to going into the penitentiary. Archambault is where I got my training. I graduated at Mission Correctional College, top of the class. And my, my responsibility was Stony Mountain to BC, now Kent Institution, Max. So that's what I, that's what I did. I also looked after provincial. And then I went back to policing. And my main job was tracking down people on warrants. I became a bounty hunter. I go to a place, I get back up, but I always find my man somewhere on the streets of Calgary, somewhere on a farm outside Calgary. But I was, and the FBI files, people that are AWOL from the military, I track them down. That I was the only trained SWAT trained officer from a reserve by LAPD. Took me a year to finish the train. So any hostage out on a reserve, I took command. So that's another feather in my hat. Then I went back into be up working in the courts, a Native Council Service or whatever. I became the first Southern Supervisor for Native Council. Two year contract and I did everything. Then we negotiated uh, uh, the so-called, uh, not go to jail, but fine option, where, where you go to jail in the summer, in, in the weekends, go, go back into lockup locally. And then I became my addiction specialist. I was a, a graduate of Nietzsche Institution. And then we negotiated treatment centers to be, to be situated on, on reservation. And then I left, became a communication officer for the college. I was the first student in 1971. Got my first two years in, in university there. I became a journeyman carpenter because we're affiliated with SAIT. So I says, I got to keep moving. Every four years, I do something different. And then I was elected to chief of to council. I served 10 terms in council. It was the young people that came to me at the Ocean Community College. I was edited in production. And I said, I just finished it. You guys can watch it. It's all ready to go. Nobody is just, we don't want to watch it. We want to talk to you. 40 students. They said, we want you to represent us in counts. Okay. So they, they told me their priorities. It took me five terms to complete what they wanted me to do. 
change. Then I went back to my teachings, traditionally took care of my alcohol, drug, my pot smoking, went to treatment center, came out. There was a hundred year old lady, my, that told me, you are a chief, you and your father, your soldiers. That's how you become a chief, not a person that you elect. In my eyes, you are chief. And when she told me that, I says, I never knew that. Just like the old warriors, like my great grandfather, Eagle Rips, one of the greatest warriors in backward territory. He, he fought 38 major battles in his lifetime, different tribes. Okay. He captured a lot of things. And so I must have been following his destiny and my father. And that's what kept me going, is I had heroes. I says, I'm gonna, when I was six and a half years old, looking out the window at my brother marching in the cadets, I whispered to my friends, I said, you know what? When we get out of this place, I'm gonna be a soldier like my father, who was wounded in the Arton Battle of Artona by artillery fire. Uh, but he came back, and when I, and when I finish being a soldier, I'm going to be a leader of my people. Six and a half years old, I didn't know I charted my destiny. Forty-nine years of my life, I did everything under the sun. When I came home, you know, my first job, I was a janitor in the residential school I went to. It was a college now. Imagine me coming to the back door and the memories come back of what happened to me there. But it's courage, forgiveness. I walked in, I work all night. <laughs> My late mother, I one of the things she told me, before I went to residential, she said, you're gonna have a tough time. But never, never dwell, never think about the sad and the bad things. Take them as a way to chart a good journey. Oh, my late wife, you told me, whatever happens, I know what's go. Continue to do the things you do because people need your help. And I could still hear that even today. Those are the two that kept me going, that put me to love all people, forgive people unconditionally. You take the good things of yesterday. You put it with the good things of today for a better tomorrow.